Hi there. The USS New Jersey just left to visit a special dry dock. She's going home. She was born in it in Philadelphia almost 80 years ago. She's nicknamed the Big J and is the most decorated of all American battleships. BB-62 has also been a museum for almost a quarter century. She and her three Iowa-class sisters are the last of the battleships to serve. They are the end of the line. It's doubtful they'll ever get back into active service except, except when you consider her punch, their punch, you can hope. So, if she's the end of the line, where's the other end? Let's go to Great Britain just before Queen Victoria was born. The Napoleonic Wars were raging. Napoleon planned to invade England and needed control of the channel. <laughs> You'd think he just asked Josephine for the remote. He combined the French and the Spanish fleets, which had Santissima Trinidad, the world's most powerful ship of the line. She mounted 136 guns on four decks. With her, Bonaparte's force outnumbered Britain's home fleet 33 to 27. It seemed this was an excellent plan of his, but, and there's always a but. The Royal Navy gave command to Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. He chose to ignore centuries of naval gospel. Tradition demanded lines of ships sail past each other, firing broadsides at the opposing line. At Trafalgar, Nelson wanted to create a melee where the captain's independence, the superior morale of the British, and his better trained crew's faster rate of fire would prevail in ship-to-ship -ship combat. Nelson divided his fleet in half and used each column like a dagger. He split Napoleon's lines into thirds. It put British ships on both sides of the center and separated enemy captains from their admiral. Best of all, best of all for the British, the front third of the enemy fleet would be out of the battle entirely. The fight was behind them. They had to turn and sail against the wind just to get back into the fight. They might get back into it to get into it. Frighteningly, at least for me, Nelson chose to sail each column directly into enemy broadsides. The two lead ships, HMS Victory and Royal Sovereign, were shot to pieces and they only had their one bow gun to fire back. This seemingly suicidal charge lasted over an hour due to the winds. As they sailed, Nelson signaled his fleet, England expects that every man will do his duty. They did before, during, and after the historic battle on the 21st of October, 1805. Mm. Vice Admiral Nelson carried wounds. He was blind in one eye. He had serious intestinal problems and he was missing his right arm. Still, he led from the front at Trafalgar, pacing the deck of HMS Victory as it endured intense fire. During the battle, Nelson was wounded again, this time mortally. A bullet passed downward through his shoulder, cut his spine, and lodged in the muscles of his back. He roared, they finally succeeded. I am dead. Brought below, he suffered for three hours, heard a victory, and gave orders to secure it. Can you imagine he still commanded? even as he bled to death. Knowing he was about to die, he asked his body to be taken to England. Nelson's last words were, thank 
God, I have done my duty. Followed by a whispered, God and my country. A brave man who in his 47 years on earth and on water became Britain's greatest naval hero. By the way, he and I share a birthday, <laughs> but little else. September 29th is also the feast day of the four archangels, including my namesake, Michael. Nelson's plan worked better than it seemed possible. 20 French and Spanish ships were lost, and not a single British one. You might think that peace and tranquility would follow Trafalgar, but, <laughs> and here's another but. Bonaparte still ruled France, and for the next 10 years, French ships of the line were built, so the Royal Navy blockaded French ports and, and, and this is a brutal land. In 1807, Britain once again attacked a neutral fleet anchored in Copenhagen to prevent them from joining France. <laughs> the Brits certainly played to win. In 1815, as Napoleon went into exile, the Royal Navy counted 214 ships of the line. <laughs> Their ships of the line. Two decades later, only 50 of these great pyramids of canvas remained in the Royal Navy. Each had barefoot seamen still going aloft, calm and storm, day and night, summer and winter. Each was built much as their predecessors had been for centuries, but, and here's another but, Great Britain was in the middle of being transformed. An industrial revolution began and it accelerated even as the American colonies were rebelling. 1776, famous year, a Scotsman, James Watt, invented the practical steam engine a fundamental transformative invention. Huh. Try saying that three times fast. Putting one aboard a ship successfully took three decades. In 1807, an American inventor, Robert Fulton, launched the Claremont. She steamed from New York City up the Hudson to Albany. And then she came back, back and forth. By the way, I often walked past Trinity Church at the foot of Wall Street in Manhattan. Fulton rests in his burying yard. The world gradually came to understand that the era of sail was ending. Gradually. Ships of the line continued to be built for another half century. Another, by the way, in 1837, the U.S. Navy launched its own. It's called the USS Pennsylvania. It had three masts, 1,100 officers and men. It had 130 muzzle-loaded guns on three decks. Mm. We were entering the world. We were. The Royal Navy, however, waited until 1851 to install a steam engine in a ship of the line. HMS San Perel had a funnel that pierced her decks and a propeller, her hull. She went where the captain commanded, no matter the wind, tide, or current. The advantages were obvious even to admirals who had spent their midshipman years training on sails. By 1858, both England and France had built or converted 32 ships of the line each. Was that naval parody? <laughs> Not yet. The next year, 1859, France launched La Glory, the world's first ocean-going ironclad. She had iron plates almost five inches thick, bolted <laughs> on 17 inches of wood hull. The designer said she could go through wooden hull ships like a wolf going through sheep. Britain was shocked. 
the Royal Navy was in the process of building two of the largest ships of the line in history. Each, each would have a steam engine. HMS Victoria was commissioned. Her larger sister, HMS Howe, was not, because it was clear that battleships would rule. The Royal Navy next built the more revolutionary HMS Warrior, the world's largest fighting ship. She had four and a half inch iron plates bolted to her wooden hull. She also had huge masts supporting acres of canvas. She was launched in 1860. Hmm? But, and this is the last but, what happened across the Atlantic in 1862 ended the age of sail for fighting ships. So what's the lesson? Might it be that just because it's always been done that way, maybe that's not the reason to keep doing it, huh? Maybe, maybe something new has arrived. Pay attention. Just because you're not looking behind you doesn't mean a new fundamental has not crept up. Alas, by the way, sails are coming back. Just as the wind is always there, naval architects have come to the realization that wind can assist ship engines. Yes, it can. I am Mike for the Be More Better team. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. Please like us, comment, follow. You might even subscribe if you haven't. Now remember, always be more better, body, mind, and spirit. And then be even more better when you make others grow. This has been a pleasure. Until the next one. Bye now. Thank you.